Friday night and Saturday.
business meeting for the upcoming year. So I want you to get it in your hands. I want you to be able to see that. If you have questions about it, you're welcome to ask about it. And uh, uh, some of it is, uh, as we've gotten uh, more used to uh, the, the system that we're using with our budget, that we were able to accurately lay out some of the expenditures that we've not been able to do very well up to this point because COVID really messed a lot of things up and, and, and uh, many other things. But uh, we think this is the best recalibration, the best estimate uh, of the high end of expenses that would be going on. So we want you to see that ahead of time so that if there are questions, we can try to answer them for you. And we're just trying to be honest about it and to work on uh, on that, keep you informed of what's going on. And so um, I'll just point out one thing here. For example, you look down the middle of the page, you have outreach and visitation. Outreach and visitation. Previous to this, uh, we didn't have a specific spot that I knew of in the budget for tracks. Understand every quarter we buy at least at least one set of a thousand tracks, and that's with the theme for the summer, for the spring, for the fall, that kind of a thing. And uh, uh, it's it's under a hundred dollars for those thousand tracks, okay? And sometimes we have to get them in English and in Spanish, and sometimes we have uh, some leftovers that we're able to not have to order. We we went out, uh, we used all the flyers that we had previously purchased for door hangers with our outreach. And so we've gone through, and uh, Miss Linda was, and Miss Salve went out yesterday, and I had to grab some of the dregs that remained, and uh, got a couple that were up here that hadn't been in the regular pile, had some in my vehicle, and I pulled those out, and I was able to give her some to use for uh, this past Saturday. But we should be getting some new ones in, and so uh, that there's an expense with that, obviously. And so we're just kind of letting you know these, these are as accurate as we can make them. In every case, I round up, I round up, and so um, trying to make sure you understand the cost will be this or less. There are some categories in this budget that we're not tapping, that we're not spending the money, but we know down the road, Lord willing, that we want to continue uh, to have that, that money set aside so that we might be able to use it if need be. But we're being, we're being as economic as we can, and we want to get that out of your hands so you can ask those questions. And so uh, please look it over. If you have questions about it, let us know. And we're trying to be as accurate and helpful as possible. And here's what we want to do. We, we want to do more for the Lord, not less. And we can't do it uh, if... if if we keep the numbers low to make you happy, it doesn't mean that that's, that matches the expenses. So we're just trying to make it accurate. All right, I did get it from uh, news from uh, Mrs. Pearson that her brother Jarvis Jordan, we've been praying for, had the triple bypass surgery, and he's doing very well right now. He's Everything's normal and he's healing up normally. Continue to pray for him, but that was good news. She was concerned about it. And I wasn't able to get that update till after the service. Uh, also, I want to remind us of the things we have been praying for. And so continue to pray for Brother Dave Ryder. Now, when I was there yesterday, I was told he was going to get a tracheostomy and get a feeding tube put in tomorrow. This afternoon, I got a text from his uncle that said they were trying to wean him off of, uh, of the ventilator so that he could breathe on his own. That would be much better than getting tracheostomy, okay, and the ventilator. And I don't know how well it went or if they'll have to put it back on. We'll have to do it anyway. But I believe this. God could heal him. God could help him. God could prevent him from having that surgery. So just pray for Brother Dave Ryer. And uh, then uh, talk with Brother Alberto right after the morning service. We were praying that his uncle might be saved, and several people had witnessed to him and shared the gospel with him, but he did pass away. And so uh, just understand that, pray for the family. And I don't know about you, if you're not sure if your loved one's saved, that hurts your heart a little bit. And so pray for the Gonzalez family with that news. Uh, Miss Jessica Henderson is going to be having surgery on a tumor. We don't know a time or a place yet. And so we, we want to make sure that they're aware of that uh, as well. And keep praying for her. Miss Cheryl Carr will be having uh, a scope on her right knee. Pray for that. That will be the 29th. 
And I think we figured out that's a Friday, so let's pray for her as, as she has that day coming. And uh, then Miss Mary mentioned this morning, her Aunt Frances Ackland this Thursday uh, is going to be having heart surgery. Let's pray for Frances Ackland. And uh, she attended here many, many years ago when I was first here. And let's pray for Miss Frances Ackland. Then her, uh, let's see, her niece's son. So if you remember Brittany, Brittany Thomas, uh, as we knew her, uh, Brittany had a son that was premature. His name was uh, is Lorenzo. It's, they call him Zoe. But uh, he's having a problem where he is, as he's eating, he doesn't breathe. So that's a problem, okay? Uh, little little Keith Ellis, way back in the day, he had to spend about a, a, a week or two in the hospital because he was doing the same thing. It's a young baby kind of situation. But pray for Zoe that he learns to eat and breathe at the same time. And just pray for that baby, of course. For Mama, that makes you nervous, especially when you don't have maybe another one at home or whatnot. And, and uh, so just pray for a little so. All right, that's those. Ladies, don't miss, of course, the Christmas party. That's in the bulletin. If you have questions about it, see Mrs. Ellis. And if you'd like to help with the food for the walking tacos, see Mrs. Ellis as well uh, to sign up for what to bring. There's a gift exchange, an ugly sweater contest, a Christmas ornament exchange. So uh, you buy and bring a Christmas ornament, or you make a Christmas ornament, and then somebody else will, and you, as you exchange them, you'll get one to take home with you. So don't miss that. Many other things. See Mrs. Ellis. She can let you know all of it. I don't know if you noticed tonight, but Chucky, you might notice it. There's a lot more gray hairs on Brother Isaiah's head. Tomorrow's his birthday. And so... Uh, I think I think Brother Ortega was asking that you would give him his birthday reminders, his little hats to help him grow a big pinch, okay, after the service so that, that he continues to grow and be, be taller. And, <laughs> and then uh, this next Sunday, guess what? We've got a, another birthday boy. They all packed him in the same, almost the same week here. And uh, Brother Iron Ortega's birthday, he'll be 21 again. And... Uh, we're excited about that for both of them, but uh, uh, don't don't forget there are a lot of things going on seriously, and so we have we have the ladies' Christmas party uh, this Thursday. We'd love to have you come. There's a piano recital uh, for those students at school, and so we encourage you if you can come. Be at the start at 6 p.m. and uh, many of the famous Ellis band will be playing, and so uh, we'll have several of them uh, playing songs for us and. And in the Segal family, uh, there'll be several play and several other students at the school. One should be coming to listen to them. Uh, then the next two Sundays, we have special things going on. And so we have the birthday party for Jesus in the morning service time. That's for the uh, first, uh, about the kindergarten through uh, sixth graders will be meeting downstairs. We'll have uh, desserts and such for them. If you can help with the dessert, see Mrs. Ellis about that. We'll be buying pizza for them, and uh, we'll just have a good time with them, reminding them that Jesus is the reason for the season. And so they'll be doing that downstairs, having fun with that. It'll be a special Christmas story for them. Then in the evening, we're going to have our, our, our grand Christmas cantata. Our grand <coughs> Christmas cantata. So the choir you've heard so much about that we've been yo yo yo, you know, uh, been doing all these other things. Uh, he knows what they are. All these things we've been doing that, that he's been teaching us and training us. We'll get to sing for you, and there'll be several songs, there'll be several special musics with it. We'll have a, 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 a Christmas-type message there in the evening service. Once you to come be a part of it, invite some folks to come, and we're going to enjoy that. And uh, uh, do we have a fancy name for it or anything? Christmas Cantata? That's the name for it. <laughs> And so we're looking forward to it. And uh, uh, then also the following Sunday, we're going to have normal services, okay? Christmas Eve in the morning. Uh, most people just sleep in, okay? You can come to Sunday school, you can come to morning service. And then as we get into the evening service, we'll have our candlelight service, okay? And so it'll be a gospel Christmas message, and once you invite folks to come for that, we'll be very careful of the time. We know some folks might have some family activities, and we want you to be prepared for that, and so that's several things are going on. 
we're excited about those things. Let's pray for these folks I mentioned. Let's be ready for everything on the calendar. Make sure that if, as you look at this, if you have any questions, uh, that you uh, see me, see Brother Bob, or, or see Brother Campos, and we can try to explain some of it to you. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is do God's business the right way. And we want you to know about it. We want you to be a part, a part of it. We're partners together. We're trying to be good stewards of the Lord's money. And so we want you to, if you have questions, to ask about that. All right. We're going to pray. And then we're going to sing, what, 243? We'll start with 243 here in a second. Lord, we come before you. We thank you for your grace and blessings. I thank you for God's people gathered here this evening. Lord, uh, it is so good to have this morning uh, many of Brother Steve's family with us. I pray, Lord, that you can comfort their hearts. Brother Steve is in heaven. He's at home. He's at home, home. And I pray, Lord, that we'll rejoice in the fact he's healed of the cancer that had afflicted him so greatly these past few months and where we missed him in our services. But we're so thankful that he's, that he's whole of Jesus right now. Lord, I pray that you be able to Dave Ryer in the hospital and just keep in touch from heaven. I pray, Lord, that he'll be able to get weaned off the oxygen. I pray that he'll get stronger, Lord. I pray that you just work in his life and, Lord, that you be real to him and that he would be able to praise and exalt your name. Lord, I thank you of the upcoming surgeries. And, Lord, I pray that you would be uh, with Mrs. Carr, uh, Miss Jessica Henderson. Lord, I pray that you'd meet both the needs there. Lord, we, we, we thank uh, the family uh, of uh, the Gonzaleses with the loss of their Uncle Vincent. Lord, I pray that you'd meet the need there. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, show yourself strong this evening and, and uh, Lord, meet with us. And Lord, I pray that you'd speak to my heart tonight. I pray that I would leave unchanged. That, Lord, I'd be closer to what you want me to be. Pleasing you, honoring you, glorifying your name. Help us now as we take a chance to sing, that we sing with all of our heart to a Savior who's worthy of it all. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to be a part of the family of God. Thank you for our church family. May you bless everything we do from this moment on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening. If you take a song book stand with me, turn to number 243. I am resolved, number 243. We'll be singing the first three verses. I am resolved in the two, the four, I am
just mention something to you. I mentioned it this morning. Some of you heard it. Some of you may not have heard it. We are working on several areas of our church to upgrade them, to get some of them uh, back up where we'd like them to be, where they're most useful uh, for where our church is at at this point. One of the areas that, that we've been working on, you might have seen if you came in downstairs, the, uh, the world on there. We're working on the missionary letters on the little boards next to them. And we got a little light there to brighten it up. And, and we're excited about what's going on there. And so we can get all that finished and focused for us. And I'm thankful for those that have been working on that. Downstairs in the, the lower floor, we have the primary church off to one side, the junior church off to one side. And at some point, we need to address the junior church. It'd be nice to, to paint it a little different, get some other things worked in there. And we're working on that. But we have an opportunity to upgrade and to work on uh, uh, to the left there, the one of the bigger rooms there. We've used it for our big days for our Spanish folks when we're using separate tables uh, down here. It's an area that we would in the future then be able to use for the same kind of manner people meet in. Uh, we have a, a, a long-term dream that God's going to continue to bring visitors and guests and uh, have time for discipleship and things like that. We want to have a nice meeting place that a larger group of people or a smaller group of people can meet. And so uh, we feel like that's the room to do it. There are some treatments that, that we've talked about that we feel will be a help to some of the sides of the walls to make them look a little nicer. And we're going to work on leaving a nice picture area in the back for times that we would have pictures. Uh, we are uh, going to uh, do several things. Some of you remember, uh, probably was that a year and a half ago or so, we had a pipe burst, and so we had a little bit of a flood downstairs in that, that area. So a lot of the carpet down there is going to need to be replaced sooner than later. Some of it had retained, retained uh, some odor where some water sat and couldn't get it all out very well. That's one of the rooms. So the next step for that room is we're going to pull up the carpet that's in there. We're going to put down uh, uh, vinyl uh, planking. And it'll look like it's wooden, like a wood floor, and it, it'll it'll be durable. If it gets wet, it won't warp, it won't have problems, it locks in together. And so it'll be a very nice looking room we're going to get all finished, it'll be comfortable, and it'll be something, like I said, that we can use as a little bit of a meeting room anytime we need to. But what we what we want to do is to be able to change out that carpet. And that carpet, if you go in there, we notice it especially. Uh, we were having our, our anniversary, our anniversary, and we, we wanted to use it uh, for uh, the Spanish-speaking congregation that meets, and, and they were expecting a big day, and needed a bigger room, and so we went down there, and we were just kind of hit by the smell of that carpet that absorbed that water, and so we want to get that ripped out, we want to put that flooring in there, and that'll go a long way towards making that room <coughs> presentable and useful. And that type of flooring is very durable. And we're not looking for top of the line where it's going to be uh, this super huge expense. But there's going to be an expense to it. It's going to cost some money to, to do that. Uh, we also uh, have Brother Ellis that will be coming home for Christmas break. And he'll have a little bit of free time. He is going to be doing some work at McDonald's. And they'll be going back uh, and forth a little bit. But there'll be some days that he has free, and uh, over the years that is something we've done a lot of, done flooring and whatnot. So he's going to come in, and, and we're going to uh, pay him and help him to get that flooring put in down there. And so we're going to purchase some vinyl flooring for that. And then we're going to also, uh, if you ladies have noticed the floor in the kitchen, it would be nice to have it look a little better, wouldn't it? And so we're going to put some of that same uh, vinyl flooring up there. Ultimately, we want to put it up in the prophet's chamber. We'll get to the place where we'll be able to start doing it. But it's going to take some money. And uh, our budget's very tight. We understand that. But we believe that some of God's people here would be willing to give. I know my family will be giving. I pray that you would pray about the Lord will let you give. But it's another, an, another necessary step to make our church more useful for some of the big days that we expect the Lord to continue to bring 
to be more useful for some of the things that we want to do with discipleship, with some other types of, uh, of hosting uh, of things down there in that room. And so what we've asked you to do is to pray about what the Lord would let you give towards that. Now we are going to, by faith, be purchasing the planking. We did the measurements for both those rooms. We'll be getting that planking because Brother Ellis will have time, like I said, in a few weeks here to come in to get that knocked out to make it look nice, to have it ready. And so we're going to do that ahead of time. But here's what I'm asking you to do. Would you maybe pray about a gift that you can give to Jesus, if you want to call it that, and allow us to, to get that flooring there. And I understand if you're like me, uh, you're fine that your dollars don't go quite as far. And there's more things clamoring for them. But I believe this, the things we do to invest, to make things nicer for the things of the Lord, are to invest in eternity saved. Now, just because you have a nice floor doesn't mean more people get saved. But I'll be honest with you, if you go into a stinky room and somebody's taking as a visitor into a room that has an odor to it, you're going to think, this may not be the church for me. And so we want to fix that. We want to address that. And uh, if you don't believe me about the odor, you can ask for the take it. You can ask for the gal. And he was in there, like, whoa! And, and we, we did some things to try to help with that. But the honest truth is, you can only cover it up so long before you need to fix the problem. And we want to get to the root of the problem, fix the problem, to make it a nice area that's useful for the church, the church family. And so that's a plan that we have. And so we have many projects that we're in the middle of trying to do things better for the Lord. And I've told you over and over as a pastor, my goal is not to build this kingdom for me, but to make it useful to the Lord. We want this place to be here when there may be a day another God brings another pastor in. Whether that's me going home to heaven or the God sees fit to say, hey, I want you to move somewhere else, whatever the case would be like that. I want this place to be able to continue on as long as the Lord tarries, preaching the gospel, reaching the Burbank, the Oak Lawn, uh, the Chicagoland area for Christ. And it's a wise use of our money, a wise investment of our money. And uh, we're not going to not buy tracks. We're not going to not buy uh, uh, door hangers that have the gospel on it. But we're going to use this also to supplement our ministry here, us serving others. And so we just ask that you be prayerful about what you can give toward that. And then make sure as you give directly toward it, we, we want you to designate that for the, for the vinyl flooring, for uh, the updating of, of, the, of the room. And that would be helpful for us so that we can get that set aside. Would you pray about that, please? Give a gift to Christ. Uh, however you feel like the Lord wants you to do. The amount that you believe the Lord wants you to do, and uh, like I said, we're going to purchase it on faith moving forward, uh, but we'd love for us to have that cost already covered, okay, and, and God's people to give towards it, and I believe this, it will honor God. It will be used in a way that will be a, a benefit to the ministry of Jordan Baptist Church as we serve the Lord, and so I want to encourage you to be prayerful about what you can give towards that, and uh, uh, we just want to keep improving the building. Uh, we, we've seen the improvement up in the parapet. It, it is, it, it's looking like it actually is supposed to be. Okay, it wasn't. It was far from what it should have been. But just like how Jesus replaced the bricks in our life, those places, those bricks have been replaced. The mortar has been put in. They're set in place. They're solid. And there are some areas of that wall up there that were bowing and are being fixed. The capstones are being put on the right way, and it's going to be a lot better afterwards, but it takes time, and it takes money, and uh, we're trying to continue to improve around the church, and, and uh, thankful for what the Lord's doing, thankful for people who are willing to serve, and uh, uh, I'd encourage you to be uh, express your gratitude to the folks that serve around the church, and I appreciate the musicians, I appreciate uh, those, I, I appreciate uh, Brother Chucky and, and, and Brother Tim Campos that will come in and will plow for us. Uh, I appreciate uh, Brother Tomas and many others will come with shovels and shovel by the doorways, the walkways. I appreciate those that vacuum. I appreciate those that clean the restrooms. I appreciate those that do all the things to make it nice for us. And uh, uh, I want this uh, to continue being a place where God's people can have a place of service and can have a, a, a piece of serving for eternity's sake. And I look forward to that. So thank you for that. And uh, pray about it. And 
and just give us more leads. Make sure you designate that. That'll be helpful for us. But we want to get that addressed. It should be several hundred dollars uh, to do that, to get the right type. And we'll be consulting with uh, people that know what they're doing to make sure we have a good quality um, uh, material and that it'll be hold out for long term. And we're just looking forward to it. Uh, ladies, can you imagine a nicer, a newer floor in that room? How long have those tiles been there? Mrs. Farr, what do you think? Are those original tiles? I don't know if they look like Jack Jack Farr, but they've been there forever. <laughs> when Jesus was a boy uh, playing in the land of Israel, the, the tiles had been laid, okay? And so we just want to update those two areas. And we're going to try to address the cabinets right around the corner and some of that countertop. And uh, it's been a, a long way. We've talked about it a long time. We're going to get to it. We're going to do it. And uh, uh, we're looking forward to continue to see things improve around the church so that we can be uh, not just a nicer, better building, but sort of a nicer, more useful building for God's people. Let's sing again. We're going to sing 142. Grab your songbook out. Stand to your feet. Stretch a little bit. And let's sing. All right, song, A Little Town of Bethlehem, number 142.
For a second, this is going to be a very unusual passage. Ruth chapter 1, we'll be reading in verse 16. And we'll be reading through verse 17. So I'll read verse 16 together. We'll join on verse 17. We're talking about how to get from here to there. How to get from here to there. The Bible says in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. What I pray is we think about the thought being conveyed by Ruth in this passage of Scripture. To her mother-in-law, Naomi. But Lord, speaking of the relationship that, that she desired to have. Having a family that she didn't rightfully, in a lot of ways, belong to. But was choosing to be part of that family. What I think about the day I got saved. I didn't deserve to be a part of God's family. But yet he loved me. But yet he died for me. Lord, because of that, I now am a child of the King. Well, I pray as we think on some of these thoughts. And we talk about how to get from here to there again. Another specific point of application tonight. That you'd speak through me. To my heart. To God's people's hearts. That we would purposefully draw closer to you. We thank you for your blessings, your goodness in our lives. May we glorify and honor you this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We were at a wedding on Friday evening, and this passage was read. And as it was read uh, through the, the little bit of service, the Bible that was being added to as they were uh, getting ready to unite a young man and a young lady together, he talked about the fact that there was a new family that was being made at that wedding. And this passage of scripture, he's talking about this is what the two of them need to do together to become one flesh. Now listen, back in December of 1985, I became part of the family of God. I was born spiritually into the family of God. In your mind, you should have a date, a time, a place. You may not remember the exact date, but you remember where you're at, who you're talking to, what you did to become a part of the family of God. By the way, if you did not do what the Bible said, you more than likely didn't do it the right way. It's important we know that's what God says that we did. But here we find Ruth, and we look here, Ruth is speaking to her mother-in-law and her mother-in-law after the passing of her husband and of her two sons said to one of her daughter-in-laws like the other one had chosen to go back. She said, listen, you can go back. You don't have to go with me. I'm going back to Israel. Leave the land of Moab. That was Ruth's home originally. But Ruth didn't want to stay here. She wanted to go there. And so she made a conscious choice and she states it so clearly here. She says, where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. She says, your people be my people. She says, your God be my God. Where you die, I'm going to die. And I'll be buried there. And she continues on. Look at verse 18. It's about Naomi looking at her daughter-in-law. When she, Naomi, saw that she, Ruth, was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking under her. She saw there was something about 
this young lady that she was serious about getting there. The place that she felt was now going to be her home. Listen, if you're not going to be steadfast in your Christian walk, you'll never get there. You might be saved, you might be here, remember, out of the world, pictured by Egypt. You may be just wandering spiritually because you're saved, you crossed that Red Sea, so to speak, pictorially, figuratively, and you're wandering the wilderness of Christianity, but you'll never achieve the promised land until you're steadfastly minded to go with God. There has to be a conscious choice, an earnestness to your heart to be knit with Him. We've talked about one element of spiritual growth, of getting from here to there. Last week we talked about purpose. Because you'll never get to spiritual growth without purpose. Where does purpose come from? Purpose comes from God's Word. In God's Word we find God's will. And, it, it, and we understand it's not enough just to read about it. It's not enough just to think about it. You have to go about putting in the effort, the practice, to accomplish God's will in your life. That means you need to be looking for opportunities today. I'll be honest, this morning I was a little put back. And it was a blessing. I think we had seven people that were either family or friends of Brother Steve Gladkowski in our service this morning. They sat right there. Nobody specifically said why, but one of the young men that was there, when I talked to him at the doorway of their house uh, the other day, really didn't have any interest in church or the things of God. But I believe they were all here, his two sisters and his brother, and then a couple other friends and family were here. I believe to honor Brother Steve. Because Brother Steve, if he was alive here on earth, I believe he would, if he had his choice, he'd be here. He made that open. More than, you know, as much as he prayed and asked us to pray for him that, that he might be healed, his prayer was that he might go come back to Jordan Baptist Church and invite people to Jordan Baptist Church and go out on a Sunday afternoon and share the gospel with folks. There was something about his life that brought family. Uh, only one of them I'd ever met before outside of the nephew at the doorway about two weeks ago. But Brother Steve got him here. God used, humanly speaking, a negative of taking their brother home to heaven to bring them to the church service. I try to be very clear, very plain, uh, teaching and preaching on what the Holy Spirit had already told me, but also to incorporate the gospel because I don't know their salvation testimonies. I wonder who's going to see your life and it's going to be an encouragement to do God's will. What are some things that are God's will? We know that's to begin with His Word. What are some things that are God's will? We, we know that uh, that is to do what God would do if he was here, sharing the gospel. We know that what is God's will? Well, for the believer, whether we like it or not, and it is popular now not to like it, is to be in church. He says, as you see that day getting closer and closer to appearing, we ought to assemble more and more, not less and less. And I don't know about you, I'm really tired of independent Baptist churches taking Baptist off the sign and going from a Sunday school hour and a morning service hour and a Sunday night hour and then a uh, 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 Wednesday or a midweek service and all of a sudden you see them starting to meet like the Catholic Church once a week. And when they come, they're not always pulling out the Bible, they're pulling out some good books that people wrote about Truth from God's Word. I don't need a good book about God's Word. I need God's Word. Amen. 
And I want us to understand, you know, some people, their idea of church is a place you go to sing. Well, listen, you can sing at church, but if you don't get preaching at church, you've not been to church. Amen. There's something about gathering around God's word that's needful for us. And Jesus was the one that died for the church. Now listen, you are not going to spiritually grow outside of the Lord's church. It's, it's, it's hard. <coughs> it's hard to live the Christian life. We need each other. We need the encouragement. We need to sometimes be strict to encourage others, to teach others, to train others. If I had my choice, humanly speaking, I could be very comfortable sitting on the couch watching football instead of being in church. I could, I could get really comfortable sleeping in on a Sunday and just relaxing all of a sudden. Or taking my kids out to do some events and some things that, that we don't normally have time to do because of Christian school or school. But we don't normally have time to do because on, on Saturdays we go out visiting. We get involved in things at the church like teen activities and things. It would be nice to have that day all to ourselves. The problem is it's the Lord's Day. It's the Lord's Day. If we're going to have spiritual growth, we find our purpose in following commandments from God's Word. Why don't you go to church tonight? The best answer is, I do it because God asked me to. That's a great answer. Now listen, we can talk about many other things. But I want us to think about another element of spiritual growth. It's not just about having purpose. A lot of people that have purpose don't ever succeed. You don't have to look any further where you want an exams time, you know. The kid, college students are in exams, or high school students will be in exams coming up. Right as soon as they come back from Christmas break in the new year, they get right into exams. And there's a lot of people that ought to have a purpose, especially in today's world, that things are so expensive. You don't, if you don't get a good education, you're going to have a hard time getting a good job, take care of a family, raise a family. And here's what we find. Some people, even with that purpose they know that they need, they don't do the diligence to study, to prepare, to do as well as they should. It's not shocking to me that you find the Oriental or Asian people typically doing very well in school because it's like a big push in their homes. Do well academically. Succeed. Make a name for our family. Work hard. In America, it's about do what you want. Relax. Go out and play. Enjoy yourself. Now listen, I'm saying some of these things because purpose only gets you so far. We can read God's word and not let it have an impact on us at all. We can go through the motions of sitting in a church service and not be impacted. Now listen, I, I'm not saying you're doing this, but I did this a lot as I was younger. I didn't even realize it. I would sit through church services because I was supposed to. I would sing, I would pray, I would stand, I would sit when everybody else was. I would listen to the preaching. Every once in a while I would take notes. But that was my spiritual life. And I'll tell you what I missed. I missed a personal walk with God. That's what I missed. My purpose was sincere that, that I was a child of God and I knew I should be those places. But I was lacking something for a long time. I was physically present but spiritually absent. How many of you, no, 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 you can attest to that? You've been in a place like that before. Now, I'm going to tell you, I was in that place. I was in church. I was teaching Sunday school. I was working on bus routes. I was I was working in duty church with boys and girls, and, and even sharing the gospel, and even seeing them bow their head and call on Christ. But I was so far from God on the inside. But on the outside, I was going through the motions of Christianity. Now listen. Purpose. 
purpose, follow commandments. But the second key element is passion. It's passion. Passion. Passion comes from free communication. That young man, Rocco, and that young lady, Amelia, that were united in marriage on Friday, just think where they'd be if in these two days they haven't said one more word to each other besides I do. Can you imagine that? They hadn't said one other word to each other besides I do. How many of you think, no, don't raise your hands, how many of you think they'd be having a good marriage right now? No, they'd be ready for counseling. Free communication. When we talk about purpose, we talk about God's Word. But I want us to think about prayer for a few minutes tonight. Prayer. That's God's way for us. It's our Word to God. Our Word to God. Passion. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Familiar verse, very simple. Many of you in here say, I don't know many verses of the Bible, this would be one to learn. This whole passage in 1 Thessalonians 5 would be a great one to start with. You learn a whole bunch of verses real quick within a few words of each other. But in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 said with a, little, a few words says a whole lot. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That word ceasing means stopping. Don't stop praying. Pray all the time. Why? Prayer brings access. Prayer brings access. By the way, there's a reason that this last week, and I'm not trying to share somebody's business, but it's kind of neat. We're excited about it. It was a big step. This last week, the college went up for Christmas lights, and he said for the first time to his girl, I love you. It was a big thing to him. They had all these things planned, and items that they were going to give, and things that were going to be said. Now listen, we live in a frivolous society and so many people say it so quickly, don't they? They meet somebody the first day, they say, I love you, and next thing you know, they're being physical, and the next week, all you know, they're gone. They're separate. They never see them again. They never talk about them again, and they're on to the next thing. It's not, it's not passion. It's just lust. It's just a little, little bit of a, a flame that fizzles out real quick. But for two years, they've been building a relationship together through what? Communication. The first year, it was a lot of, uh, of texting or, 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 or calling and talking to each other on the phone, back and forth. He was in college, she was at home. Last year, she came to college, had an opportunity for dates, an opportunity to go to events together. They had an opportunity to do a lot of things together. And the more they talked, the more that fire started to burn on the inside. Now listen to me. Some of us, we became a child of God. We spent reading some things of God's word, his word to us, and they're needful things. But the truth is, we're not talking to God from our heart. Some of us, we memorize prayers that we pray. The Bible talks about vain repetition. Dear God, bless us. Give us a good night's sleep. We thank you for all you've done. Amen. And, and we say that every night. It's like, you ever get used to talking on the phone? If you talk to your family, a lot of times you'll, 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 you'll be talking to them at the end. You'll say, all right, I love you. I 
won't ask how many of you have done it before, but I'm going to tell the truth. I've said it to some people I shouldn't have said it before because I, I, I got talked with them on the phone at the end of the phone call that I was tired and distracted. I said, I love you. And it was like, oh! You don't take it back once you say it. But, if, you know, it's like I called Brother Seagal and I asked him about how things are going with his work and, and let him know Gabriel's a really bad boy at school today. And at the end of it, I say, all right, it was good talking to you. I love you. And it's like, oh, wait a second, wait a second. I, uh, I didn't mean that. What do I mean that? No, oh, I uh, you know, What do you do? Now, listen. You're passionate when your heart is open to someone. When you're honest with someone. We think about passion in the scriptures, about somebody being open, and you don't have to look very far, but you find in Psalms, David over and over opening his heart to God, doesn't he? He cries out to God over and over about his situation. He cries out to God about so many different things. I happen to love Psalm 51. Now, some of you in here, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Psalm 51 is where David had sinned with Bathsheba, and he comes back to God, and his open prayer to God to forgive him for the sin between him and God, and you see David open his heart so much, and even ask the Lord, create me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. <clears throat> You know what happened in that passage of Scripture as David opened his heart that I was wrong? Is there was a passion that built in him. I want you to look with me there. Turn to Psalm 51 real quick. And, and I, I've showed you before, but I love this. This is one of those areas, one of those Psalms that became very important to me when I had a cold heart and my heart was away from the Lord. God used some sin in my life to get my attention You see in verse 10, the passage I just alluded to. Here David is crying out to God. Well, let's look at verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly. And you keep on going. You see him speaking to God about his need for that right relationship with him. Verse 10, create me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Look at verse 11. But before we get to verse 11, I'm going to allude to it. If you are like me, there's been a time in your heart that the Holy Spirit pointed out sin to you. You felt very distant from God, didn't you? You felt like even praying was difficult to do because how do you pray to a God that you know that you've done the opposite of what He wanted you to do? How do you ask Him for mercy when He never did anything wrong to you, but you continually wronged Him? It'd be like having a boyfriend or girlfriend, and uh, instead of just having eyes for them, you were always constantly looking at somebody else, and talking to somebody else, and flirting with somebody else, and you didn't have eyes for that person, and you see that person, you don't look at them the same. Look at verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence. Sin will drive you from the presence of God. Now listen, God doesn't drive you from His presence, your sin will. And you'll feel like God threw you to the side. God never did. He's just waiting for you to be right with Him, to make up with Him. He longs for you to be by His side again in sweet fellowship. Cast me not away from Thy presence, notice this, and take not Thy Holy Spirit from me. I'm going to talk about a subject that may be helpful to some of this room tonight. You may not be there. I've been there before. I've been there multiple times. When sin has risen up in my life, I oftentimes wonder, am I saved? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I wonder how many of us tonight have ever felt like we're not sure if we're saved or not. We doubted our salvation. We, 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 we know what the Bible says, that you can't lose your salvation. 
But we just know we feel that emptiness, that absence of peace from God's presence with us. And we feel like there's something between us and God. And it must be that I am not saved. This is what David is saying to God. Take not thy spirit from me. Now listen. Does God take salvation from anybody that's his child that sins? No, because that would be work salvation. You don't have to do everything God says and then he lets you stay saved. He, you're saved because of his mercy and his grace and his love for you. Amen. And that doesn't change outside of anything that you do. doesn't mean you should gloefully and gleefully sin. It means that you ought to live your life cautiously to stay within the love of God the right way. Being faithful to him as he's faithful to you. But here we see... When you're in sin, you're going to feel like you're not in God's presence. He's not with you. You're going to feel like His Spirit has been taken from you. And so many of us, we doubt our salvation in times like these. Restore unto me, in verse 12, the joy of thy salvation. I remember that dark period of my life in my 20s and I, I had a hard time singing because I, I was just crying. How can I sing the songs of God when I'm in such utter, I'm so turned so far from it? Just the words themselves convicted me. And uphold me with thy free spirit. We need God to come alongside us when we're found in sin, don't we? This is David's heart, isn't it? It's being open and being poured out. And what's it doing? It's bringing him into the access. It's bringing him into that period of attachment to God. It's strengthening that bond in his life with his God. Hey, I'm not perfect, but I need you, Lord. Please, you do what you can do. I love you. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to feel like this. I want to be close to you. And as God does the work on the inside, here's what happens. Verse 13, and this is something that comforted my heart. The very midst of me being far from God in my heart, having been a sinner, having pushed away the Savior, now seeking Him to make it right. He says, when you restore to me that joy of my salvation, when you renew that right spirit within me, when you, when you bring me back into your presence and you give me that spirit, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach transgressors thy ways. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. Listen. I'll promise you, most of us in this room, the time that we were most sincere about sharing the gospel with others, we realized how much we've been forgiven of our Savior. Have you forgotten who you were? I love the song Amazing Grace. When my brother Ortega had given me that on a, a canvas. You guys know Amazing Grace is what we're talking about right here. Amen. John Newton knew that he was a slave owner. That he was a person that brought slaves here. And as he poured out his heart to the Lord in song, it became a song. <clears throat> the times I've been most broken and God brought the healing, I spoke the most of him. And I want you to understand as we sit in this room and our heart grows cold, we've allowed a wall to build up, a callus to build up, where we don't feel the presence of God. That can be even though we have purpose. We're a child of God still. We're still on our way to heaven. We're, we're still, we're, we still might be going to church and nobody knows what we're struggling with on the inside. We might still be teaching a Sunday school class. We might still be even going out soul winning. And, and we're just going through the motions because when we start, well, who do we turn to? Who's going to understand how I feel? And I, I promise you, everybody in this room has been through stages like this in their life if they're honest. Amen. 
There's not one of us that have escaped the grace of God. But when it comes and it falls on you, how precious His presence feels. <coughs> Here's what David's pouring his heart out to God. And he, and he says, at this lowest time, when I don't have the answer, and I know you do, that's when you use me the most. God's word gives purpose, but prayer, that passion that comes from that strong attachment to him, when you know you need him and you don't deserve him, you're going to talk about him the most. I'm going to be very honest and very blunt right now. If you're not telling people about Jesus, you're far removed from him. He didn't send you away. You walked away. Maybe slowly. Maybe you ran. But a person that's close to Jesus can't but speak of how good Jesus is to him. They can't but tell people about how wonderful God is. Listen, if we're not careful, here's what we do. We get so used to being saved that we forget that we need God to be saved. Amen. Listen, without Christ, I can do nothing. But with Christ, I can do all things. Because He brings strength to me. I'm paraphrasing that verse, and you understand that. I'm not trying to directly quote it. He brings strength to me. He brings the ability. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, when you get saved, when, when you realize, as verse 9 says, you have to confess your mouth, believe in your heart. In verse 10, you have a confession, and, and it talks about with your mouth, and it talks about believing in your heart. It comes and it says that you will not be ashamed. Listen, if, if you can't open up your mouth about Jesus, you better understand you're far from Him. Amen. But that attachment is strengthened as we learn to pray. Have you ever thought about Jesus and the agony He went through as He prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane before He went to the cross? The more fervently he prayed to the Father, the more, more heavy the burden and the cup became for him. His purpose was to bring freedom to you and I. But the prayer brought passion to him. For he wept so hard and he sweated and he prayed so hard that it was like literal blood was flowing from him. Because of the burden. Passion. And he asks us to pray without ceasing. And yet, if we're a normal Christian, we pray for our meals, maybe. If we're a normal Christian. Wednesday night, you know, it's so boring. All they do, they get together, they talk for about 15 minutes in the Bible, and, and they spend half, most of the time in prayer. Shame on us. Let me ask you, when was the last time you prayed and you felt the closeness of God? Amen. When was the last time you prayed and you started weeping? When was the last time that as you prayed, there was free communication? God speaking to your heart and your heart speaking to God. Prayer brings access. It draws us closer to God. Curtis Hudson said one time, God may be out of sight, but he is certainly not out of reach. He is only a prayer away. Let me ask, how close are you to God tonight? I'll be honest with you, I'm bothered so often. And I, I'm, I'm not picking on anybody, I'm not saying I judge anybody. I'm talking about me. How so often we can sit in messages where God's word is being preached. Truth is being laid straight. Sometimes it's against my sin. Sometimes it's a reminder of things I've left undone that he asked me to do. 
and the invitation is given. And I harden my heart and I don't go forward. I don't fall on my face and I don't call out to God. I mean this. I so much appreciate what Brother Aaron and Miss Kim Carr do for us. When they come, they play the offertory for us. You understand? That's their time to pray too. That's their time to do. I'll be I'll, I'll be I'll be honest with you. We'll have the missionary guest speaker come, and oftentimes they'll say, "A pastor, come close the invitation." And I'm thinking, I need to start the invitation in my heart. When was the last time you hit the altar? Not so everybody can see, but so God would hear. Amen. Listen, we have burdens. We, we have complaints we'd like to pour out to the Lord. And, and, and I'm not talking about just murmuring and complaining. I'm talking about heavy things that are just weighing on us. And yet we have freedom to talk to Him at any time. And yet do we? A lot of tears in my life have been spilled at an altar. A lot of tears at home in prayer. I'll, I'll be honest with you, some of the sweetest times of prayer were not prayers where I prayed a lot of words. It's where I just opened up my heart to God. I just wept. How long has it been? You ever try to talk to somebody? You say, hi, how are you doing? Uh-huh. Oh, what, what do you think about this going on? Uh-huh. 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 I mean, you're, 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 you're sweating from trying to get a conversation going with them. And it's like they can care less about ever talking to you. You know what I'm saying? And, I mean, you're trying to talk to them, trying to get to know them. You're trying to uh, hold a conversation. They're not with it. And I wonder how, how many times that's us when God's waking in heaven and saying, Yes, son. Amen. Yes, daughter. <coughs> I don't want to be profound as a preacher. <coughs> I'd rather be known as a simple preacher who preaches on simple things. But until we get our Bible learning right in our life, we won't have purpose. When there's not followed commandments, you're not going to be spiritual. There's not going to be growth. But when you don't have passion, it's dead. There's no fire. There's no fire. I can think of a young girl in the church. Everyone wanted us to like each other. And she was pretty. I have to think I might have been handsome, handsome at that day. I was about half the size this way. Had a lot of hair on my head back then, uh, believe it or not. And uh, I, I thought I thought I was the cat's meow, so I thought I was okay. She was intelligent. I thought I was pretty intelligent. But there just never was that, and I'm going to use the word not inappropriately, but appropriately. There was no passion between us. We were friends. We were good friends. But I didn't feel like I felt when I saw Mrs. Ellis. I wonder how much passion is missing. And I'll tell you the problem. There's no free communication. God's been talking to you through his word. He's been asking you questions in your heart. He's been giving you a dream and a vision of what he wants for you. 